subscribe to our youtube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates ladies and gentlemen it's a great pleasure for me to be the delivering the 17th justice pd desai memorial lecture justice desai's distinguished judicial career spanned over two decades during which he established himself to be a fearless independent judge and an exceptional administrator he always believed that law and justice are essential agents for initiating social change his desire to build a better tomorrow can be witnessed from his humanitarian actions the creation of perlin trust and its noble actions symbolize his belief that the law must have a human face rule of law is the topic that i am going to speak on today irrespective of what era we are living in who the rulers are what the mode of governance is this is one topic which is never going to lose its sheen and relevance because the story of rule of law is nothing but the story of civilization of humans when talking about the rule of law it is necessary to first understand what the law is law is in its most general sense is a tool of social control which is backed by the sovereign however is this definition complete in itself a question i would think not such a definition of law makes it a double edged sword it can be used not only to render justice it can also use to justify oppression renowned scholars have therefore argued that a law cannot really be classified as a law unless it imbibes within itself the ideals of justice and equity an unjust law might not have the same moral legitimacy as a just law but it might still command the obedience of some sections of the society to the detriment of others what is clear is that both these thoughts highlights certain facets of what is meant by the term law i think that any law backed by a sovereign must be tempered by certain ideals of tenets of justice only a state that is governed by such law can be said to have the rule of law the legal history of pre independence india gives us a clear picture of this the british colonial power enacted various laws to further their economic and political interests at the cost of the colonized the british used the law as a tool of a political repression enforcing it unequivocal on the parties with a different set of rules for the british and for the indians it was an enterprise famous by for rule by law rather than rule of law rule by law rather than rule of law as it aimed at controlling the indian subjects judicial remedies lost their significance as they were administered keeping in view the best interests of the colonial power rather than what was just or legal the historical trial of raja nandakumar in 1775 a case famously recounted as the judicial murder of raja nandakumar amplify demonstrates this raja nandakumar has accused the then governor general war hastings of receiving bribe shortly after this incident charges of forgery were preferred against raja nandakumar on 15th june 1775 raja nandakumar was found guilty of the charges and was awarded the capital punishment by chief justice simpe a close aide of war hastings the trial had many peculiarities such as instead of being tried before the local courts by local man he was tried by a british judge and jury who arguably did not have jurisdiction historians have later stated that raja nandakumar paid the price for daring the accused the, the order general war hastings 
around 150 years later, there was growing consciousness about the value of liberty, equality, justice, and fraternity. As part of persistent and organized campaign for the freedom, the Indian masses were increasingly made aware of how unjust and oppressive the discriminatory laws of the colonials are. In 1922, during his famous trial, Mahatma Gandhi captured the imagination of the nation with the following words, I quote, little do they realize that the government established by law in British India is carried on for this exploitation of the masses. In 99 cases of out of 100, justice has been denied to Indians as against Europeans in the courts of India, unquote. He thus concluded, in my opinion, the administration of the law is thus prostituted consciously or unconsciously for the benefit of the exploiter, unquote. Our struggle for independence thus marked our journey towards establishment of a state defined by the rule of law. The move from a colonial past to the present required a shift from the colonial idea of laws imposed by foreign rulers for their benefit to laws given by our people to govern themselves. Laws which are not merely commands but are also embedded by a sense of justice. There was a need to give guarantee for the laws to be framed with human face for the benefit of the masses. A framework was needed to ensure this. The framework that which forms the binding link between law and justice in, the, in this country. That is what we the people gave to ourselves in the form of the constitution. When the farmers set out draft constitution, the existing social conditions played a crucial role. The newborn country was faced with enormous challenges such as illiteracy, poverty, immense religious, ethnic, linguistic, and social diversity. The framers envisaged a document which not only took care of the prevailing conditions, but would also continue and be relevant for all times to come. It is therefore conceived as a living document whose contents evolve over the years as the courts deal with new situations and questions and interpret the constitution in the light of the same. The constitution embodies the, within itself the concept of the rule of law and the same can be witnessed from our preamble, the fundamental rights, the directive principles of state policy and separation of powers, etc. By situating the concept of rule, the law at the confluence of three important values, human dignity, democracy, and justice. Our founding father showed the path for the rest of the world too. In its 1955 Act of Athens, the International Commission of Jurists explicitly stated the state has to be subjected to the law. Subsequently, in the year 1959, under the Supreme Court of the same commission, International Congress of Jurists, consisting of 185 judges, practicing lawyers and teachers of law from 53 countries convened in New Delhi and issued Declaration of Law, which is one of the seminal document on rule of law. After reaffirming the Act of Athens and particularly the need for a completely independent judiciary, the International Congress of Jurists declared that the rule of law is a dynamic concept which must be employed to safeguard and advance the civil and political rights of individuals in a free society. Now, more than 70 years down the line, the entire world is facing an unprecedented crisis in the form of COVID-19. At this juncture, we necessarily have to pause and ask ourselves as to what extent we have used the rule of law to ensure protection to and welfare of all of our people. I do not intend to provide an evolution of the same, but both my office and my temperament prevent me from doing so. But I begin to feel that this pandemic might yet be a mere curtain raiser to much larger crisis in the decades to come. Surely, we must at least begin the process of analyzing what we did right and where we went wrong. Coming back to the topic, from within the perspective of legal positivism, 
many concepts of conceptions of rule of law have emerged from dicey to lord bingham different formulations of principles informing the concept of rule of law have been made it would be impossible to adequately address the rich tapestry woven by human intellect in this area in the course of a speech however i thought it would be relevant to emphasize both principles given the current events across the globe the first principle is that law must be clear and accessible the law must be clear and accessible this is the fundamental point that when laws are expected to be obeyed the people at least ought to know what the laws are there cannot be therefore be secretive laws as laws are for the society another implication of this principle is that they should be worded in simple unambiguous language in furtherance of the above principles in india we are constantly striving to make legislations and judgments accessible to general public by translating them to various indian languages the second principle relates to the idea of equality before the law equality before the law this laws are to be applied on an equal basis in non arbitrary fashion this is of course an important fundamental right promised under the indian constitution an important aspect of equality before law is having equal access to justice i must emphasize that in a democratic country like ours access to justice forms the bedrock of the rule of law however this guarantee of equal justice will be rendered meaningless if the vulnerable sections are unable to enjoy their rights because of their poverty or literacy or any other kind of weakness in india the legal aid authority is estimated to serve more than 70% of the population who are entitled for free legal aid making the indian legal aid system one of the largest in the world another aspect i want to highlight over here which might be a bit of a tangent but certainly very important is the issue of gender equality traditional rules of changing within the family as is the structure of the family itself most nations have recognized equality and dignity of women either constitutionally or statutorily the legal empowerment of women not only enables them to advocate for their rights and needs in society but it also increases their visibility in the legal reform process and allow their participation in it bias and prejudice necessarily lead to injustice particularly when it relates to the minorities consequently the application of the principles of rule of law in respect of vulnerable sections has to necessarily be more inclusive of their social conditions that hinder their progress this leads to me to the third principle which is that members of society have a right to participate in creation of reinforcement of laws that regulate their behavior we live in a democracy the very essence of a democracy is that its citizenry has a role to play whether directly or indirectly in the laws that govern them in india it is done through elections where the people get exercise their universal adult franchise to elect them people from the part of the parliament which enact laws incidentally we the indian people have give ourselves the universal adult franchise from day one of the coming into existence of our republic unlike some of the advanced democracies in the 17 national general elections in the 17 national general elections held so far the people have changed the ruling party or combination of parties eight times which accounts for nearly 50% of the number of general elections in spite of large scale inequalities illiteracy backwardness poverty and the alleged ignorance the people of independent india have proved themselves to be intelligent and up to the task the masses have performed their duties reasonably well now it is the turn of the of those who are manning the key organs of the state to ponder if they are living up to the constitutional mandate it has always been well recognized that 
the mere right to change the ruler once every five few years by itself need not be a guarantee against tyranny. The idea that people are the ultimate sovereign is also to be found in notion of human dignity and autonomy. A public discourse that is both reasoned and reasonable is to be seen as an inherent aspect of human dignity and hence essential to a properly functioning democracy. As Professor Julie Stone observed in his book, the essential to a properly functioning democracy. As Professor Julie Stone observed in his book, The Province of Law. Elections, day-to-day -day political discourses, criticisms, and voicing the protest is integral to the democratic process. The idea of the judiciary as a guardian of the constitution brings me to the fourth and final principle, the presence of a strong independent judiciary. The judiciary is the primary organ which is tasked with ensuring that the laws which are enacted are in line with the constitution. This is one of the main functions of the judiciary, that of judicial review of laws. The Supreme Court has held this function to be a part of the basic structure of the constitution, which means that the parliament cannot contain the same. But the importance of the judiciary should not blind us to the fact that the responsibility of safeguarding constitutionalism lies not just on the courts. All the three organs of the state, that is the executive, legislature, and the judiciary, are equally repositories of the constitutional trust. The role of the judiciary and scope of judicial actions is limited, as it is only pertains to the fact space before it. This limitation calls for other organs to assume responsibilities of upholding constitutional values and ensuring justice in the first place with the judiciary acting as an important check. For the judiciary to apply checks on governmental power and action, he has to have complete freedom. The judiciary cannot be controlled directly or indirectly by the legislature or the executive or else the rule of law would become illusory. At the same time, judges should not be swayed by the emotion, emotional pitch of public opinion either, which is getting amplified through social media platforms, judges have to be mindful of the fact that the noise thus amplified is not necessarily reflective of what is right and what is majority believes in. The new media tools that have enormous amplifying ability are incapable of distinguishing between right and wrong, good and bad, and the real and fake. Therefore, media trials cannot be a guiding factor in deciding cases. It is therefore extremely vital to function independently and withstand all external aids and pressures. While there is a lot of discussion about the pressures from the executive, it is also imperative to start a discourse as how social media trends can affect the institution. The above, however, should not be understood as meaning that judges and the judiciary need to completely disassociate it from what is going on. Judges cannot stay in ivory castles and decide questions which pertains to social issues. The path we took to perform our duties without fear or favor, affection or ill will applies equally to governmental and non-governmental entities. The ultimate responsibility of a judge is after all to uphold the constitution and the laws. Reasons, reasonableness and protection of human dignity are the values that will serve as well. I would now like to speak on the role of lawyers in upholding the rule of law. It demands expertise, experience, and commitment. Lawyers have an obligation to perform their duties with integrity and diligence, with full respect for the court, opposing counsels, clients, victims, witnesses, and persons involved in the proceedings. We need social virtue rather than economically self interested behavior. Historically, Lawyers have a rich tradition of social activism demonstrated by the number of lawyers who participated in the Indian freedom struggle. In part, this civic virtue stems from their having had a public-minded clientele. We need now 
to rebuild and recreate a, a tradition of civic professionalism. We need a professionalism ideology about social responsibility. Here, I would urge both Eng and Senior Council to extend a helping hand to those in need of justice. Extending ease to access to justice is no less a social justice. Let economy, gender, class, or caste never be a hindrance in the path of securing justice. Undoubtedly, reverence for the rule of law is our best hope for survival as a free society. In order to advance the rule of law, we primarily need to create a society where rules of law is respected and cherished. Only when the citizens believe that they have fair and equal access to justice can we have sustainable, just, inclusive, and peaceful societies. Citizens can strengthen the rule of law by being knowledgeable about it and by applying it to their daily conduct and pushing for justice when needed. I am taking the liberty to quote in Telugu Mahakavi, Gurajada Para, a poet and a reformist of 19th, 20th century. He said, I quote, Desamante Matti Kadoi Mansloi, Desamante Mansloi. Gurajada gave a universal definition to the concept of nation. He said, a nation is not merely a territory. A nation is essentially its people. Only when its people progress, the nation progress. You are the stewards of this nation and custodians of every rich tradition. I hope that you contribute by way of giving back something to this society, to this great nation, which has bestowed you with so many privileges. I must lastly state that the work of ensuring complete justice as aspired to under the constitution can never be said to be completed. The mandate of our constitution is to work tireless to surpass our own expectations to make India a country wherein rights are cherished and which sets an example for other countries to follow. There is no better way to end this speech on rule of law which then reciting a poem of Kabiguru, Kabiguru Rabindranath Tagore, where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where words come out from the depth of truth, where tireless striving stretches its arms towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into dreamy and desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by the into ever-widening thought and action into the heaven of freedom. My father let my country away. Thank you. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Namaskar.